1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of each week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So now concerning is used again in this letter, and it's also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 8, and 12. Uh, it means Paul is replying to something the Corinthian Christians asked about. And so the collection for the saints, Paul is referring to a collection he gathered for the saints in Jerusalem. In several other passages, it's going to speak of this effort among many of the different churches to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, Acts 24, verse 17, Romans 15, verse 26, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, and chapter 9 as well. And Paul mentioned his heart for the poor Christians in Jerusalem in Galatians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So the business of relieving the poor members of the church is a moral duty, a sacrifice with which God is well pleased in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Aphroditus or Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a a sweet-smelling aroma and acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. So our faith must work by this love. So why was the church in Jerusalem so needy? Well, there was many reasons. We know that they supported a large number of widows in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and they were in the middle of a famine in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 30. So generally, Christians have excelled in these efforts of practical ministry. For example, why do you think of the Red Cross as named the Red Cross? It started as a Christian organization. And some have thought that because Christians are commanded to help the poor, especially Christians in need, that this is more important than supporting ministers of the gospel. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is going to speak of the responsibility of the church to honor widows and consider ministers of the gospel worthy of double honor. So while Christians have a responsibility to help the poor, it does not come before the responsibility to support ministers of the gospel. So general principles from the Bible for supporting the poor in the church. Benevolent distribution is a uh, potential source of conflict and division, and it's the job of deacons to prevent such problems by their wise spirit-led actions in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. The church has an obligation to help the truly needy, and it must discern who the truly needy are in James chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 will say, Honor widows who are really widows. And so if one can support, uh, if one can work to support himself, he is not truly needy and must provide for his own needs. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, which will say, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that some that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are of such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 will say, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11, That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So if one can be supported by their family, he is not truly needy and should not be supported by the church in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, where it says, Honor widows who are really widows, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. And so those who are supported by the church must make some return to the church body. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 5, where it says, Now she who is really a widow and left alone, trusting God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. As well as 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10, where it says, Well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. And it is right for the church to examine moral conduct before giving support. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9-13, through 13, where it says, Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she had been the wife of one man, 
well reported for good works. If she had brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, washed the saints' feet, if she's relieved the afflicted, diligently followed every good work, but refused the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith, and because they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. And the support of the church should be for the boat for the most basic necessities of living. First Timothy chapter six verse eight, where it says, In having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. So the ancient Greek word for collection is logia, and it means an extra collection, one that is not compulsory. Uh, this is not a tax upon the Christians of Corinth. They were free to give as their heart directed them. It is also possible that the sense of an extra collection refers to the idea that this was a collection to receive gifts above their regular giving. Paul may be receiving a special offering for the poor of Jerusalem for that particular cause. And so for Paul, he says, I've given you orders, so you must do also. Uh, this is not an option. The Corinthian Christians were responsible to take an offering among themselves for the needs of the poor Christians of Jerusalem. They cannot say money is unspiritual, we'll just pray for them. This commandment, coupled with the idea of an extra collection, shows that they were commanded to take an offering. But not every Christian was commanded to individually give. They had to give as God put it on their heart to give. Right? God loves a cheerful giver. There is no hard 10% direction to the church. And so Paul wanted their giving to be systematic, not haphazard. Uh, when they came together for worship in the word, they were commanded to receive an offering at the same time. And the first day of the week is going to refer to the fact that the early Christians met on Sunday, not the Sabbath. They were not against meeting on the Sabbath. They just knew that all days were alike to the Lord in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where it says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink in regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. And they also wanted to celebrate the day that Jesus rose from the dead, Luke 24, verse 1, where it says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So it is plain from here that uh, the gospel churches were to assemble upon that day. Nor do we read in scripture of any assembly of Christians for religious worship on any other day. So who was supposed to give? Each one. Paul wanted everyone to give. Every Christian should be a giver because God is a giver in John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So lay something up, you know, lay something aside, storing up. <clears throat> this has the idea of coming to church with your gift already prepared. In other words, you should seek God about your gift at home and prepare it at home. This makes one seek the Lord more in their giving and helps them resist any manipulation to give. And as he may prosper, believers who have more should obviously give more. And we should give proportionately. That is, if you give $10 a week when you make $100 a week, you should give more money when you make more money. And we shouldn't fear giving generously. Proverbs 11 verse 24 is a great commentary on this idea. There is one who scatters yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. No one thinks a farmer is wasting grain when he scatters it as seed. The more he plants, the more he will harvest. And Paul didn't want to manipulate anybody. He wanted giving from the heart, as each heart heard from God, and not in response to a high-pressure fundraising program. Verses 3 and 4. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem, but it... But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So Paul wanted a representative from the Christians in Corinth to help deliver this gift to Jerusalem. The Corinthian Christians could choose their own representative. Paul did this to be above reproach in financial matters. So your gift, literally Paul's, Paul's going to call giving a cheris or a grace, a, a gift that's freely given. Paul calls it a grace because it flowed from their free love towards the poor brethren or because their sense of the free love and grace of God to them, which was which that which moved them to be to that charitable act. And so Paul sometimes called giving a koinonia, which means a fellowship sharing, uh, in Second Corinthians chapter eight, verse four, where he will say, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints, as well as uh, Second Corinthians 
chapter 9, verse 13, where it says, While through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men, as well as Romans 15, verse 26, where it says, For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. Sometimes Paul called giving a diaconia, which means a practical service or ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 as well. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, where it says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, where it says, For the ministration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. Verse 5 through 9. Now I will come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I'm passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend the winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you, if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So Paul is going to leave all his plans up to the will of the Lord. He planned to go through the region of Macedonia, or Macedonia, visiting Corinth. Uh, but things happened differently than he planned. Instead, Paul made a soon painful visit to Corinth to personally confront them in some of these areas. And so why didn't Paul go to Corinth immediately? Because he sees that God has given him an opportunity now in Ephesus. Paul wisely relied not only on his own desires, but on God's open doors. So Paul knew the secret of directed service. And Paul also knew that opposition often accompanies opportunities. Acts chapter 19 speaks of both the opportunities and opposition Paul had in Ephesus at this time. Verses 10 and 11. Now if Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord, as I also do. Therefore let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace, that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. So Paul had trouble with the Corinthian Christians, not respecting his authority as an apostle and a minister of the gospel. If they didn't respect Paul, what might they do to a young man like Timothy? So Paul's asking the Corinthians to respect Timothy when he comes. And so he says, let no one despise him. This echoes Paul's later words to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, which says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So apparently Timothy suffered from both a lack of confidence and a lack of respect. And it's important for God's people to not take advantage of this in Timothy. And it was important for Timothy to never give other, uh, others reason to despise him. And so wherever Timothy was, he was on his way to see Paul and would probably stop on Corinth on the way. Verse 12. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. So Paul did not sit as a commanding officer over Apollos, who is mentioned among the apostles in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, and chapter 3, verse 22. This is going to give us a rare insight about how the early church leaders related to each other. It was not a, uh, a hierarchy relationship, and... Paul did not dictate his will to Apollos. Verse 13 and 14. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. So in a sense, each of the men, each of these are going to mean the same thing. We stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Um, simply saying it in a different way. Christians are to be like strong soldiers on guard, watching for their Lord's return. Jesus commands us to watch in Matthew 24, verse 42, where he says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Matthew 26, verse 41, where he says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Mark 13, verse 37, will say, And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Paul warned Christians to stand fast in their liberty in Jesus. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, where he says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In Christian unity, and um, he tells him to stand fast in Christian unity in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, 
where he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. He also tells them, uh, Paul tells Christians to stand fast in the Lord himself. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And in the teaching of the apostles in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by the word or our epistle. So, this is the only place in the New Testament where the word translated, be brave, is used, which is andrizomai. Literally, it means to act like a man. Be brave in the King James is quit you like men. That is a good, accurate translation of the idea behind the ancient Greek word. And so, Christians are told to be strong in passages like Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, where he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so, the terms in this verse are all military. right? Be continually on your guard. Keep in your ranks. Do not be disorderly. Be determined to keep your ranks unbroken. Keep close together. When you're attacked, do not flinch. Maintain your ground. Resist. Press forward. Strike home. Be strong. If if one company or division is opposed by too great a force or an enemy, strengthen that division and maintain your position. Right. Summon up all of your courage. Sustain each other. Fear not, for fear will enervate you. So all the watching, all the standing fast, all the bravery, and all the strength that Corinthian Christians might show meant nothing without love. They were called to do those things in a meek, humble spirit of love. Verse 15 through 18. I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that is, the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such, and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaeus, For what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit in yours, therefore acknowledge such men. So these were three men who brought the questions of the Corinthian Christians to Paul. As Paul is going to send them back with this letter, Paul asked that they be received as devoted servants of the Lord. Apparently, Stephanus was the head of the household, and Fortunatus and uh, Acacius were two household slaves of his who accompanied him on his visit to Paul. Um, Fortunatus and Acacius were common names for slaves or freedmen or former slaves. And so they refreshed my spirit. So Paul was especially grateful for their coming because they ministered to Paul's needs when they visited. What they did, they did what the Corinthian church should have but did not, right? What was lacking on your part, they supplied. So Paul could call the household of Stephanus the first fruits of Acacia or Achaia because they were among the first saved in that region, and they were baptized by Paul himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Verse 19 and 20. The churches of Asia greet you. Achilla and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord, with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. So, Achilla and Priscilla were a married couple who ministered with Paul at Corinth in Acts 18. Now they were in Ephesus with Paul, and they sent their greetings to the Corinthian Christians. The early church met in houses because they had a very, very few meeting places of their own until about the 3rd century. And the entertaining room in a moderately well-to-do household could hold about 30 people comfortably. Therefore, in any given city, there was probably many different house churches. And Jewish custom and early church tradition indicate that the holy kiss was a common greeting in that culture during that time. And uh, the holy kiss is not hollow as Joab and Judas. And it's not carnal like a harlot in Proverbs 7 verse 13. So she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face, she said to him. Verse 21 through 24. The salutation with my own hand, Paul's, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. O Lord, come, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, my love be with you all in Christ Jesus, amen. So Paul had a secretary write the letters as he dictated them. Often he added a personal note at the end of his own, uh, in his own handwriting, which seemed to be poor, according to Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, where he says, See, with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And so Paul again stresses the importance of love, pronouncing a heavy curse on those who walk, who talk of commitment to Jesus, but they have no genuine love for him. So how can we tell if someone does or does not have the uh, love for the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Love is an affection of the heart, not discernible by overt acts. Accursed is going to use the ancient Greek word anathema. Paul said in Romans chapter 9 verse 3 that he was willing himself to be an anathema from Jesus if it could accomplish the salvation of the Jewish people. In fact, anathema was the third of three levels of discipline among the ancient Jews. The first level was a simple separation of a man from the synagogue for 30 days. If one did not repent in those 30 days, he was under a second degree of discipline, giving him still an undefined time to repent, but warning him of a dire consequences to come. The third level was the anathema, with, and with all the hope of reconciliation and repentance was cut off. The man could never be reconciled to the synagogue and was no longer accounted as a Jew at all. So love the Lord Jesus Christ. So how can we grow in our love for the Lord Jesus Christ? You can strive to make prayer and reading and holy conference your delight. And when delight comes in, you shall little by little find the sweetness of Christ, till at length your soul be over head and ears in Christ's sweetness. Then you shall be taken up to the top of the mountain with the Lord to know the delights of spiritual love and the glory and excellency of a seen, revealed, felt, and embraced Christ. And then you shall not be able to loose yourself off from Christ and to bind your soul to old lovers. Then and never till then are all the paces, emotions, and wheels of your soul in a right tune and spiritual temper. If you want to grow in your love for the Lord Jesus Christ, stay in his word. Learn about him. See what he has said. And Paul looked for the return of Jesus. Maranatha is Aramaic for, O Lord, come. And this was one of the earliest words of the Christian vocabulary. And uh, the letter is going to end with Paul pronouncing a blessing of grace and love towards the Corinthian Christians. Paul's final word before the Amen is Jesus. He has emphasized Jesus from the beginning to end in this letter. Paul's final words, written with his own hand, do much to reveal his heart of love. Even though he had to rebuke, he had to rebuke these Corinthians rather strongly. It was Paul's love for both Jesus and his church that made him such a great apostle. Love, which is expressed through humble service, makes us great in the kingdom of God.